four and a half thousand years ago. Northern Europe is slowly emerging from the Stone Age. In the Mediterranean, the roots of two great civilizations, Greece and Rome, have yet to take hold. In Mesopotamia, the mighty empire of Assyria is still far in the future. But to the south, on the northeast tip of Africa, something unparalleled in antiquity is taking place. Rising from the banks of the Nile River in Egypt are three colossal pyramids, monuments to the most enduring civilization the world would ever see. When the Greek historian Herodotus visited Egypt four and a half centuries before the birth of Christ, he was awestruck. The wonders were greater than those of any other land, he observed. There were pyramids taller than any man-made structures on earth. Avenues of sphinxes, half man, half beast. And towering stone pillars called obelisks. There were giant statues of long dead pharaohs. And exotic mummies encased in gold. And everywhere, the enigmatic symbols of its sacred writing. Here, reaching across the chasm of time, was a civilization that had flourished for more than 3,000 years. To the ancients, Egypt was already ancient. Cleopatra, who ruled during the first century BC, is closer in time to us than she is to the pharaohs who built the pyramids. Egypt is so old that for centuries its origins remained shrouded in mystery. Even the Egyptians weren't really sure how old they were or where they came from. Herodotus said Egypt was the gift of the Nile. But the Egyptians knew from the beginning that life on the Nile could be precarious. Isolated by an endless expanse of desert, vulnerable to a river that was unpredictable, and a climate that could dramatically change, civilization in Egypt was forged in part by the realities of a harsh environment. The Egyptians called it chaos. Lurking in the background were powerful forces waiting to be unleashed.
Because disaster could strike at any moment, the Egyptians clung to a profound belief. Order, not chaos, was the will of the gods. To maintain order and keep chaos at bay, the Egyptians envisioned a king who was a living god, the earthly manifestation of Horus the Hawk, ruler of the skies. Pitted against him was the unruly god Seth, the harbinger of chaos. The eternal conflict between order and chaos would ultimately guide the destiny of Egyptian civilization. But the true story of how it came about vanished in antiquity. In the twilight of Egypt's greatness, around 300 BC, a priest named Manetho began the awesome task of compiling the first complete history of Egypt. The challenge would have been daunting, yet in temple libraries and on the walls of Egypt's most sacred places, volumes had already been written. A thousand years before Manetha was born, the pharaoh Seti I built a temple at Abydos dedicated to Osiris, the god of the dead. In a special hall of the ancestors, his son, the future Ramesses II, is shown reading from a papyrus. The document, carved on the wall in hieroglyphs, contains a list of 76 royal names in chronological order. Each name is encircled by a stylized coil of rope. The symbol called by Egyptologists a cartouche identifies a king. Together, the kings ruled over 2,000 years of Egyptian history. Using temple documents such as these, Manetho organized his history into 30 royal dynasties. The earliest name on the list is Mene. King Mene founded Egypt's first dynasty about 3100 BC. According to Manetho, he reigned for 60 years during which he expanded Egypt's borders and won great acclaim before being carried off by a hippopotamus. Before King Mene, Egypt was ruled by demigods called the Spirits of the Dead, but their names were long forgotten. Were the Spirits of the Dead history or mythology? Where did Egyptian civilization really begin? Ironically, not along the banks of the Nile. Seventy miles west of the Nile in the Sahara Desert, it's so hot and dry, what little rain that falls evaporates before it hits the ground. Here in this desolate landscape lived a tribe of nomads who just may have been the ancestors of the pharaohs.
Fred Wendorf of Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, heads an international team of archaeologists who've been scouring the desert looking for signs of human occupation. In 1974, they located an ancient settlement on the rim of a shallow basin they call Napta Playa. The Sahara was not always parched and arid. Radiocarbon dating reveals that at about 8,000 BC, tropical Africa's summer monsoon shifted northward, increasing the rainfall on the desert and allowing seasonal lakes to form. One such lake was Napta Playa. Here, surrounded by stretches of grassland to feed their livestock, people could take shelter from the heat and the vagaries of the desert. But the rain was unpredictable. Without it, the lake dried up. Three days without water meant the difference between life and death. With survival hanging in the balance, a remarkable thing happened. Co-leader of the expedition, Rumold Schild of the Polish Academy of Sciences, has discovered a tiny circle of stones, a Stonehenge in miniature, but 2,000 years older. He thinks it was used to predict the coming of the rainy season. Well, this humble pile of rocks that you see here is actually one of the oldest calendars ever found. This one consisted of a stone ring and two stone, upright stone alignments that I call gates. You can see them here and there. And one of the alignments points to the north, exactly. The other one, though, that you can see in this, going in this direction, points to the position of the sun on the 21st of June. That is the beginning of summer. The beginning of the rain season in this belt of Africa. The discovery of this calendar circle only hinted at what was to come. Nearby, several unusual stones were also found, arranged in circles, marking the location of deep pits. The stones, some weighing over one and a half tons, didn't come from Napta Playa. They'd been dragged here from a distant quarry. For the desert dwellers to transport large stones and erect them required an incredible amount of effort and organization. The question is, why? Fred Wendorf thinks they may mark the graves of important people or honor their spirits. Perhaps someone powerful enough to intercede with the gods and bring rain. One of the most imposing objects was found in this pit, perhaps the final resting place of a ruler or a chieftain. At first it looked like an ordinary boulder, but when Wendorf examined it more closely, it turned out to be a primitive sculpture. We found this very large and carefully shaped stone down in this hole, about a meter above the uh, large bedrock outcrop here that's shaped like a mushroom. You can see how carefully it's worked and smoothed on the surfaces, sharp edge, and you can see how they were able to control the uh, length of the piece by uh, 
making grooves in this face here, which you can see. And then by using a wedge, they were able to uh, strike off the flakes at exactly the points that they wanted to. This is altogether a very impressive piece of, of uh, stonework, and it may well mark the beginning of Egyptian fascination with working in large stones. It is also an important marker of social rank because the ability to control large numbers of men that were needed to shape this stone, to bring it into position, to shape the bedrock below, uh, required that there would be numerous people for a considerable period of time to accomplish all of this. And this indicates that this individual had a higher rank than the others. Here, 7,000 years ago, the first crude monuments in Egypt rose from the desert to honor a fallen king and bring order out of chaos. But for the people of Naptiplaya, the sands of time were running out. Around 5000 BC, the summer monsoon began to shift again, this time south. The rains eventually stopped and oases like Naptiplaya permanently dried up. Forced to abandon the desert, the settlers headed due east, towards the Nile. The Nile is Egypt's lifeblood. From origins deep in East Africa, the river flows northward some 4,000 miles before reaching Egypt's Nile Valley, an oasis over 600 miles long. For the last 100 miles, it fans out into a wide delta before spilling into the Mediterranean Sea. Throughout Egyptian history, the Nile was both a blessing and a curse. Once a year, swollen by monsoon rains in Ethiopia, the river flooded its banks, depositing nutrient-rich soil Egyptians called the Black Land. Without it, Egypt would be barren. With it, one of the most fertile regions on Earth. But in the past, the river was as unpredictable as rain in the desert. Too high a flood could destroy villages. Too low a flood meant famine. To escape the chaos of uncertainty, the Egyptians devised the world's first calendar based on three seasons of four months each. It's the model for the calendar we use today. But this time, they weren't watching the weather. They were watching the Nile. The time of the flood was called inundation. The time of emergence was when the water receded and crops could be planted. During the dry period, when the Nile was lowest, the crops were harvested.
Working together, the Egyptians dug wells, built dikes to protect their villages, and developed the rudiments of geometry to redraw their property lines each year. By 4000 BC, after the people of Naptaplaya had settled in the Nile Valley, the first glimmerings of Egyptian civilization began to appear. Beautifully decorated pottery, animal-shaped palettes designed for mixing cosmetics, and flint knives so well made they've never been equaled, some with elaborately carved ivory handles. Gradually, between 4000 and 3000 BC, two powerful kingdoms emerged. Because the Nile flows from south to north, the kingdom that flourished in the Nile Delta is called Lower Egypt, the land of the papyrus plant. The kingdom of Upper Egypt, the land of the lotus, blossomed in the Nile Valley. The symbols of the two kingdoms are woven together throughout Egyptian history. They signify the union of the two lands into the world's first great civilization. What has long puzzled archaeologists is how and when unification took place. Renee Friedman of the University of California at Berkeley and her colleagues are looking for clues at the site of the ancient capital of Upper Egypt. What you got over there, Sean? Uh, we got what appears to be a man. Called by the Greeks, Hierakonpolis, the city of the hawk. It was Egypt's first city. About 35 to 50 year range. Today, its monuments and structures are long gone. Instead, craters dug by robbers litter the site. A century ago, archaeologists thought that all that was left of the desert was a plundered cemetery not worth exploring. Little did they know that hidden in the sand was a wealth of new information. New discoveries show that by 3500 BC, Hierakonpolis was one of the most important settlements along the Nile. Over two miles long, it was a bustling community of farmers, administrators, craftsmen, and potters. One potter was manufacturing cookware for his neighbors. He signed his pots by pressing his thumb into the wet clay just below the rim. 5,000 years later, fragments still cover the ground near his kiln. Because of a freak industrial accident, it is possible to identify his home. These are the remains of the potter's house. It's the oldest preserved house in all of Egypt, and we owe its fine preservation to the fact that the potter worked a little bit too close to where he lived. Fortunately for us, but unfortunately for him, one day a shift in the wind caused the fire from the kiln to travel the short distance to the house setting it alight. The fire reddened and hardened the native silts and the mud bricks that formed the lower portion of the house and reduced the posts and the mats of its walls to the charcoal and ash that we see here. On 
the north side of town was a vast industrial complex of bakeries, Egypt's earliest known breweries, and granaries for storing wheat. But the most important structure in Hierakonpolis was uncovered in 1985, when archaeologists stumbled upon several large holes six feet deep, large enough to support massive wooden columns 20 feet tall. These columns formed the facade of a massive shrine that would have dominated the entire temple complex and the town of Hierakonpolis as a whole. This is the earliest known temple in Egypt. Nowhere was the power of the king more evident. During ritual ceremonies, the king, seated on a throne, would oversee the sacrifice of animals to the hawk god Horus, the patron of all future kings of Egypt. Designed to evoke the silhouette of a crouching animal with horns and a tail, the temple was lavishly appointed with colored mats and pillars, perhaps made from cedars imported from Lebanon. The prototype of all the great temple complexes to come, it dominated the landscape of Hierakonpolis. But for now, the city of the Hawk had a rival, Bhutto, the capital of Lower Egypt. Situated north of modern Cairo in the Nile Delta, today all that remains of Bhutto is a huge amount of earth and debris and these stones and statues, which are dated 2,000 years later. But in this trench, archaeologists have uncovered the fragments of hundreds of clay pots dating back to the same period as Hierakonpolis, 3,500 BC and earlier. Dina Faltings of the German Archaeological Institute is in charge of the excavation and an expert in the study of ancient pottery. By reassembling the fragments and comparing them to pottery from Hierakonpolis, she's made a surprising discovery. Bhutto in early times was the home of a very different culture. The pots from Bhutto are less sophisticated than those from Upper Egypt. You have here a lump of clay on the bottom, and then they put in some upright slabs, and they, they just squeeze this together and burnish the surface to close it. In contrast to that, we have some imports from Upper Egypt, like this pot. It's a very little, elegant form. The quality is, you know, the, you can hear it, it's much tighter. And, um, well, this comes from uh, much better technology. They had better kilns in Upper Egypt. And obviously, the lower Egyptian people who made this kind of pots uh, realized that too, so they tried to imitate these pots. But uh, with their lower Egyptian technique and skill, which is not very high, so they didn't do a very good job. Dina Faltings' work at Bhutto reveals that by 3200 BC, the superior culture of Upper Egypt had swept through Lower Egypt, and the two kingdoms became one.
But was the transformation peaceful? Or was it bloody? The union of the two kingdoms along the Nile was a milestone in Egyptian civilization. But how it came about was a nagging question. All archaeologists had to go on was a single object found at Hierakonpolis in 1898. This exquisite ceremonial palette made of slate dates back to around 3100 BC. It was dedicated by a king of Upper Egypt called Nama, who some believe was the legendary King Mene, Egypt's first pharaoh. On one side, Nama, wearing a bulbous crown, is about to strike down a prisoner in the presence of Horus, the hawk god of Hierakonpolis. On the other side of the pallet, Nama, wearing a crown with a curled tongue, appears in a procession moving towards two rows of decapitated prisoners. The lions, their long necks intertwined, symbolize unification. The key to understanding Nama's palette is in the crowns. In Upper Egypt, the king donned a white crown with a bulbous tip. In Lower Egypt, a red crown with a long protruding tongue. Together they form a double crown, signifying that Pharaoh had become the lord of the two lands. For the next 3,000 years after unification, the image of the king wearing a double crown would appear on statues and temples throughout Egypt to reinforce his dominion over all the land. Nama's palette seemed to confirm that unification occurred after a bloody conquest. But for a century it remained the only evidence, until a tiny object turned up at Egypt's oldest royal graveyard, Abydos. Believed to be the final resting place of Osiris, the god of the dead, the ground is strewn with broken pots, the shattered remains of offerings to one of Egypt's most important gods. Long before the pharaohs carved their tombs in the Valley of the Kings or built the pyramids, Egypt's first rulers were buried here in large brick-lined graves. Extensively explored around the turn of the century, Abydos was thought to have yielded up all of its secrets until 1977 when German archaeologist Günther Dreyer reopened the site. Since then, he and his team have reinvestigated the tombs of several early kings, including that of King Nama. Ah, Aiwa. Aiwa, Dreyer is excited about the discovery of an ivory label. Labels like this were originally attached to jars of oil. Small as it is, it contained a big surprise. It seems to depict the event on Nama's pallet. This is an ivory label of King Nama found near his tomb. Such labels served to indicate the date of shipments of oil. 
At that time, dates were indicated by names of years, and these names were chosen after the most important events of that year. In this case, it's a victory of uh, King Narmer over the Delta people. And obviously, it's the same event as depicted on the famous Narma palette. From this, we may conclude that the Narma palette indeed refers to a historical event which took place in a certain year. But the label is only one piece of the puzzle. Another discovery at Abydos suggests that the process of unification had begun long before Narma. Under these mounds of rubble, Dreyer found the tombs of kings from a previously unknown dynasty, which Egyptologists now call Dynasty Zero. In the tombs were more labels, even more astonishing than the first. Here, etched in ivory, was clear-cut proof the Egyptians had developed a fully evolved system of writing, not only earlier than previously thought, but earlier than the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, who are credited with being the first to produce a written language. The earliest Sumerian writing, seen here, was an accounting system made up of simple pictures and numbers. Egyptian writing already contained sound signs like modern alphabets. The hieroglyphs on these labels all represent sounds. The snake stands for the sound J. Along with two triangles, it spells out the word Ju, which means mountain. The symbols read the mountains of darkness referring to the west where the sun sets. The hieroglyphs on other labels indicate the king was already collecting taxes from both upper and lower Egypt. A sure sign unification had already taken place. To consolidate the kingdom, a new capital was built exactly where Upper and Lower Egypt meet. Founded by King Mene, who Egyptologists believe is the historical King Nama, Memphis was destined to be the greatest city in the land. For 3,000 years, the pharaohs would rule Egypt from Memphis. Yet today, all that's left are ruins, but none dating back to the time of King Nama. Egyptologists have long assumed that the ancient capital was always located here. But David Jeffries of the Egypt Exploration Society thinks Memphis was somewhere else and has spent nine years trying to find it. Using a simple manual drill, he has taken a series of core samples from fields two miles west of the ruins. The cores uncovered a substantial layer of artifacts ten feet below the surface. Typically, what we expect to find uh, in this area, just a, a few metres down from the position that we've reached at the moment, is pottery in the lowest level, the lowest silt level, pottery that represents the period around 3000 BC of the earliest kings of unified Egypt, and which represent the foundation of the, the national capital in this area. What would cause the nation's first capital, a grand city of palaces and temples, homes and administrative buildings, to pick up and move? Two great natural forces, the desert and the Nile. We're standing here on the very edge of the Western Desert, looking over the Nile Valley towards the cliffs on the east side, 
The valley is only seven kilometers wide here. It's as narrow as it is anywhere in the, this northern part of the Nile Valley. And what we believe we've established, we're looking down at the area where we've been doing these drill cores, what we believe we've established is that the river flowed very close to this desert edge and that the city actually stood uh, along it, uh, directly below where we are, and that as sand swept in from the western desert and as the river at the same time moved eastwards, that the city followed the movement of the river to where the recognised ruin field is today, about three kilometres across the valley. The chaos of the shifting Nile on one side and the encroaching desert on the other haunted the Egyptians throughout their history. To overcome the ever-present threat of danger, they would put their faith in one man and the power of the gods. To protect themselves from disaster, the Egyptians vested their king with absolute power and worshipped him as a god. Only a god could talk to gods, and only a god could avert chaos. To preserve order, called Mart, personified as a seated goddess with a feather on her head, the pharaoh undertook daily rituals. To appease the gods, he built elaborate temples and furnished them with food, drink, and other offerings. Chaos came in many forms. It could manifest itself as a violent storm, sand blowing off the desert, or a foreign enemy. Images of the pharaohs as triumphant warriors are repeated again and again throughout Egyptian history. This one of Ramesses II appears on a temple constructed nearly 2,000 years after Nama conquered Lower Egypt. Ramesses probably never led an army into battle. The image is more symbolic than real. A message to all who saw it that the king fulfilled his sacred duty to maintain Mart, the divine order. More likely, the pharaohs supervised their military campaigns from afar. In 2280 BC, a senior court official named Weni ordered the details of his extraordinary career carved on the walls of his tomb. Weni relates how his pharaoh, King Pepi, dealt with the tribe of marauding nomads. When His Majesty took action against those who dwell in the deserts of the east, he raised an army of many tens of thousands from all over Upper Egypt. There were noblemen, seal bearers, chieftains, and mayors. I was the one who commanded them. This army returned in safety. It had ravaged the sand dweller's land. It had sacked its strongholds. It had thrown fire in all its mansions. His Majesty praised me for it beyond anything. With awesome power and destructive force, chaos could also erupt out of nowhere. Not far from the site of ancient Memphis, in a stone quarry at Helwan, 20 miles south of Cairo, is the world's oldest dam. 
Although it's hard to envision after 4,000 years, this massive pile of stone was part of a huge engineering project designed to control flash floods. Fascinated by early Egyptian technology, Günther Dreyer made a detailed study of the dam. He calculates it took 500 men 10 years to build it, hauling into place some 184,000 tons of stone. By any standards, the dam was an extraordinary attempt to thwart chaos. Unfortunately, it didn't work. The dam spanned the wadi from over there to there and had a length of about 330 feet and a height of 42 feet. It was rather solidly built in a cross section. It would look like that at the base, a length of 300 feet, on top about 150 feet. It consisted of three parts. In the middle, a loose filling of sand, and on both sides, a package of rough stones covered by a casing of dressed limestone blocks. Unfortunately, the dam was overflowed before it was finished. The water came over here and destroyed the unfinished part. And then, within a few minutes, huge amounts of water ran down the wadi and uh, destroyed all installations downwards. And so, the work of about 10 years and 500 workmen was just in vain. For the Egyptians who built it, the disaster was a tragic reminder of how destructive the forces of nature could be and of the need for constant vigilance. It was the Egyptians' unique vision of the cosmos, shaped by their environment, that sustained the world's most enduring civilization. At the center of it all was the king. With skills forged by his ancestors in the desert and honed along the banks of the ever-changing Nile, he maintained the balance of the universe with justice and piety. He fought the unrelenting onslaught of nature, social upheaval, even the supernatural. But in the end, there was one final, immutable battle with chaos that no one could escape. Although the king was a god, he was also a man. He was going to die. To avoid calamity, he ordered the Egyptians to begin hauling large stones to the desert's edge. Slowly, a new kind of monument arose that would come to symbolize the king's ultimate triumph. The triumph of eternal life. The age of the pyramid builders had begun.